Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the March 1st, uh, 2017 meeting of the Frederick County Planning Commission. And to begin our meeting, would you join us in a moment of silence, please? Thank you. We have an agenda to adopt. Move that we approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. All opposed. We have also a uh, July 4th, excuse me, that's quite something, January 4th meeting minutes. Move for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you. We have a number of our committee reports. I'd like to ask Mr. Unger if he would uh, speak to us regarding the Frederick County Sanitation Authority. Yes, ma'am. Board met February the 21st. Uh, they had they went over their 10-year uh, capital improvement plan, and they've got about 56 major pro uh, projects they want to do in the next 10 years, totaling about 71 million dollars. <throat> uh, two of the most important ones are going to do here within the next couple of years is relocate the Anderson Water Treatment Plant. Uh, currently, we're buying about a million gallon a, a day off of the. Uh, or moose, and they were paying about $900,000 annually for that. And what they want to do is try to get water at another location of the, uh, the creek so that they won't be paying so much money to car moose. The other th important thing they're going to do is the uh, Opekin water supply plant. They're going to build that on right just real close to where the plant is now. It's on 78 acres that they purchased, so hopefully in the near future they'll have another location for that to where they will have their own land and stuff. And uh, we have right now 15,151 water customers, 14,659 sewer customers. Rainfall for the uh, last month was 3.58, which is a little above average. It's usually around 3.06 a year or a month. Uh, we drawed 1.7 million gallons from the deal plant last month, 1.5 million gallon from the Anderson plant. We purchased 1.9 million from the city. Daily average is 5.2 million gallon per day. And uh, the paper mill has got a hydro flow of 2.6 million ga gallon. Previous month it was 1.9 million gallons, so it has gone up some. The Opecan plant has got 3.2 million gallon. Previous month it was 2.4 million gallon per day, so it has gone up a little bit. They're going to be working on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for a development uh, review and regulations, Mr. Kenny? Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> you caught me off guard. I'm sorry. Uh, we met last Thursday uh, and we reviewed, and I wasn't prepared for that report. I was prepared for the transportation one. I'm sorry. Uh, could you help me out on what we reviewed there? I'm drawing a blank. Uh, what we did, development review and regulation. One of them was, uh, I think, making the distance from a, a right of way to a building or something less or something. I don't know how that went down, but it's a private private road right away. Thank you, Mr. Unger. Be happy to help out if I may. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the DRS looked at uh, one with some reduced setbacks in the rural areas yes. for accessory structures or accessory structures, excuse me, and also. Uh, some of you have been, have been on the planning commission for some time. We're looking at different uses in the RA zoning district yeah. to sort of catch up with. Uh, with the, with the changing uh, market for uh, agriculture, agroterrorism, and you're going to be seeing that um, probably the next couple months till we get something firm before it comes before you. Thank you. Right. No, thank, thank you, you Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the <laughs> Transportation Committee, we had him running around too many times. All ready for transportation. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Uh, sorry. Don't uh, worry. I sat in for. Uh, Commissioner Oates, uh, we had a meeting this past Monday. Uh, the Terry Short from VDOT and Ed Carter from VDOT was there. They gave a report, as did on their smart scale update. 
Uh, the status of that is that uh, that's a very conv convoluted, com complicated type of system they're using to justify that. Frederick County is getting some of the smart scale dollars. Uh, you'll see that on um, at the end of Paper Mill Road uh, there, Sawful Spring Road, some other projects there. We had an update on the MPO draft work program, uh, which is Route 11 North and Valley Pike, uh, Valley Pike <coughs> Corridor studies. We had an update on that. That's moving forward, and dollars are being allocated for those. We gave us an update. Uh, John, Mr. Bishop gave us an update on the county projects. We had the Snowden Bridge Boulevard, which is in the final items are being addressed for wrap up and being turned over to VDOT. Tevis Street Extension and Airport Road at the 81 Bridge. Uh, that's about 30% design uh, right now. They need the comments back to finish that and move that forward. Renaissance Drive on Route 11 North. They're currently working with CSX uh, there to, to decide which way they're going on the crossing there. Uh, that is moving forward also. Um, rezoning is forthcoming in that area. Valley Mill Road realignment. Uh, that's on 30% design as it currently stands. There's no activity on the Coverstone, Coverstone Drive. Um, and then Jewel Early Drive extension change with Route 7. Uh, they are waiting for some draft agreements to come forward on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. We have uh, Michelle from the city of Winchester. Um, her whole entire name is Shelley Wolf. Thank you. Um, we had a light meeting in February. We voted to forward a conditional use permit for Long Ridge Cigars to establish a private club on Feather Bed Lane to council with a positive motion such that they can serve alcohol to club members. And then additionally, we reviewed the 2016 planning and zoning annual report, which is available online if anyone is interested. Good, thank you. Thanks for being with us. And finally, Mr. Blaine Dunn from the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Madam Chairman. On Washington's birthday, February 22nd, the board met. And we did two items that are pertaining to this, uh, this commission. One, we added some rows in the Meadow Edge, Meadow Edge, Meadows Edge area, there are short tenth of a mile road systems that were added to the Virginia uh, road system. And the other was that the board passed a Reliance Road truck restriction, which closed Route 627 to trucks from I-81, exit 302, to the Frederick Warren County line. The proposed alternative route is I-81 to I-86 to Route 522. This restriction will apply to commercial vehicles exceeding 30 feet in length. Normal delivery trucks will be allowed, but through traffic will will cease. Thank you, Mr. Madam thank, Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Dunn, very much. This is the time um, on our agenda that we invite anybody in the audience who has a subject they'd like to discuss with us to come forward. And uh, if you had any comments uh, regarding these public hearings, I'd appreciate your keeping them until we get into that section. Is there anyone who would like to suggest something to us? No? Seeing none, uh, we will close the uh, citizen comment portion. Our first item is a public hearing. It's conditional use permit 10-16 for William Conley, submitted for a cottage occupation furniture repair shop. The property is located at 5738 North uh, Frederick Pike, uh, Route 522, and is identified with property identification number 19A-25D in the Gainesboro Magisterial District. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. Um, this uh, property, if you could turn to your up to the map at your left, kind of gives an outline. It's on 522, as you pointed out, Madam Chair. It's currently zoned RA, as the rest of the properties up there, um, and its uses are uh, surrounding properties are residential and vacant, respectively. Um, the Frederick County Zoning Ordinances allow uh, cottage occupations uh, in our rural area zoning districts with an approved conditional use permit. Uh, this proposed cottage occupation uh, it will be for a furniture repair business located within an attached garage, approximately 25 or 21 uh, by 25 in area. Um, should the uh, planning commission feel that uh, this use be appropriate, staff will recommend the following conditions. And meeting with the applicant, the applicant also um, agrees to these conditions for the record. Number one, all review agency comments shall be complied with at all times. 
Number two, there's no retail sales permitted. Number three, is hours of operation will be Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Number four, there'll be no employees with the, um, other than uh, those residing on the property. Uh, number five, there'll be a cottage occupation sign will be permitted. Uh, there was a typo in your um, agenda, it did not have the cottage occupation sign. In order for him to have the sign, we have to have it as a condition. So that was, uh, uh, staff apologizes if there was any confusion. And number six, any uh, expansion or change of use shall require a new conditional use permit. Uh, Mr. William Conley of the Furniture Doctor is actually here to answer any question. He is the applicant, and I'll answer any questions that you or any of the uh, commissioners may have on this proposed uh, cottage occupation. Okay. Any, any questions, Mr. Chair? And yes, Mr. Thomas. Hasn't that business been or been in use here for quite some time now? Yes, it came as a result, Mr. Thomas, uh, as through a zoning violation. Um, they cleared that violation up is by getting a conditional use permit. Anyone else? Any question? <clears throat> Anyone have any question of Mr. Conley? Or Mr. Conley, wherever you are, if you'd like to speak to us, come on up here and do that. If not, you can just stay where you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Conley, do you understand all the conditions and agree to all the conditions? They did a good job uh, explaining it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of anybody? So, what should we do? <clears throat> Madam Chairman, um, I move that we Approve conditional use permit number 10-16 for approval for the cottage occupation for furniture repair at the described uh, location on North Frederick Pike. Second. <clears throat> Mr. Unger? Unger, yes. Marston, yes. Klein, yes. Thomas, yes. Bolden, yes. Kenny, yes. Triplett, yes. Dunlap, yes. Moon, yes. And the chair votes, yes. This will go to the Board of Supervisors on April the 12th, Mr. Conley. <coughs> Okay, our next item is also a public hearing item. It is a conditional use permit of 01-17 uh, for Bowman Library and Perrin uh, Shenandoah Mobile LLC wireless commercial telecommunication facility. Submitted to construct a wireless telecommunications uh, consisting of a 195 uh, foot telecommunication monopole tower with supporting equipment in a fence compound. The property is located at the Bowman Library at 871 Tasker Road and is identified with property identification number 75B-A-1 in the Shawnee Magisterial District. And again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again, Madam Chairman. Um, if I could turn your attention again to the map on the left, uh, the outline, I think we all know where Bowman Library is. Uh, that's the outline right there for you in the map. The uh, properties surrounding them are RP, residential performance, and their uh, land use is going to be residential, open space, and vacant. <clears throat> um, this is just the area to kind of give you an idea, again, of, of where we're talking. Uh, this proposed 195-foot monopole to, uh, commercial telecommunications facility is located on approximately 16-acre uh, property that is currently zoned RP, residential performance. The property is located within the urban development area in the stormwater service area as identified in the comprehensive policy plan and is located within the South uh, Frederick area plan. These plans identify this area to remain residential in character. Um, the Frederick County Zoning Ordinance, however, allows for uh, commercial telecommunications facilities within our RP zoning districts with an approved conditional use permit. Uh, the applicant is also applying for a, a waiver of the setback requirements, and the applicant is requesting this um, through the ordinance, which does allow um, and if the, for a 75-foot setback reduction. Uh, the proposed telecommunication tower is required to be set back from this property at 200 feet. Um, and, and as you can see, the, uh, uh, the math quotation works out, gives them that fall ratio when you go, uh, as, as our ordinance requires, for every foot you go up, you have to take in consideration the fall ratio. So that's basically what that is. Um, and, th and this is a waiver that the Board of Supervisors will, uh, will act on. Obviously, the Planning Commission has to review it. Uh, this, uh, if I'm going to kind of blow this up a little bit of sight, kind of illustrates 
where the telecommunication facility will be located and referenced you know, on the property um, and why we need the um, reduced setbacks or the applicant needs reduced setbacks, excuse me. Should the Planning Commission find this use to be appropriate, staff will recommend the f these following conditions be assigned to this conditional use permit. One, all review agency comments should be complied with at all times. Number two, the tires should be available for co-location or prop. Uh, personal wireless service providers. Number three, a minor site plan should be uh, approved by Frederick County. Number four, the tire should be removed by the applicant or property owner within 12 months of abandonment of operation. Number five, in the event this the telecommunication tire is not erected within 12 months, the approval of this conditional use permit will be deemed invalid. Uh, number six, any expansion or change use should require a new conditional use permit. For the record, Mr. Lynn Kerner representing this application is here to answer any questions. We also have uh, for you as one of the questions in case the planning commission will have, which is on the slides behind this, is our um, RF uh, promulgation maps, which he has a promulgation engineer. Also, the um, applicant did do a balloon test. We do have photographs from that. I'm going to let the applicant, I can answer some of these questions if you need, because it, it met what we, what the county is, was looking for as for land use. Okay. Um, and, but they, they, they can you know, walk you better through that than I could as with the RF. With that, Madam Chair, I'll answer any questions you any of the planning commissioners may have on this conditional use permit for a commercial telecommunications facility. And the applicant is here, too. Thank you. Yes. Any questions of Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. I hear one. Yes. Uh, Mark, what's the reason they have to have a variance for the amount of fall for the tower? Why can't you move the tower to a location where that wouldn't happen? The, the applicant has asked, I'm going to let the applicant answer you as we go to the promulgations, uh, Mr. Unger, um, for what they did their citing. It's close to the property line where they're setting this, and as you know, um, th through other conditional use permits, if they get too close, I, I think the last one we had was a, a few months back. We we had one um, that was the only place they could set it. That was, if I'm not mistaken, up in Greenwood Road. I think the questions came up, you know, could they set anywhere else? And that was where they can get the signals. Um, that's why they need the waiver, because our ordinance requires, you know, for every foot you go up, you have to have a foot for the fall ratio. Um, as far as the location where the tires, uh, I'm going to refer to the applicant, because he's going to show you the promulgation uh, maps and explain, walk you through that a little bit if you need that answered. Anyone else for Mr. Chairman? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Is your name, please? Madam Chair, my name is Ed Donahue. I'm local counsel for Shentel, the applicant. Mr. Yes. Sharon uh, referenced Mr. Lynn Corner. He's going to be the first witness. We actually have two witnesses. Shentel asked me to kind of coordinate things in hopes of giving you a more orderly presentation. <coughs> Lynn Corner is going to explain the site acquisition process, the sites that he looked at, also the negotiations with the folks uh, at the county about the library, and hopefully answer your question about the, the waiver and the setback. Also, Mr. Chris Saar is here. Chris is a senior RF, or radio frequency engineer, with Chantel, and he's going to explain the propagation maps, the need, and how this site fits within the network. So I'm going to introduce Mr. Corner at this point. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the uh, of the commission. Uh, my name is Lynn Kerner. I am a uh, site acquisition consultant with Chantel. And um, first of all, how we got to this um, this location, just scroll through a couple here. and um, it, it, It's to improve service in, in a specific area, and uh, Mr. Saar will get into that. But <clears throat> how, how the site acquisition process works is RF identifies a need through, through their operations, through um, various customer complaints, um, and they issue basically a ring and say, we want something in this location, and this is how tall we need it. Hand it to me, assign me, or appropriate person, and we go out and we look around to see what we can find in that area. Um, in this area, um, it's a little bit small on the map, but uh, you can see right in there the, is the lake, which is right next to the uh, library. But down in, in the lower, down in the bottom down there is a site down at Sharando, down by the high school. Uh, that's one of the surrounding Chantel sites. Over on 522, right over in here where the old uh, school uh, 
the radio station was. That, that is another site, that's a surrounding site. And then up, as you can see up in the top, upper left, there's a little, the red and green location. Uh, that's a site uh, on the Hockman property uh, up in that area. Now, then there's another site, if you look at the Exxon sign down by the uh, intersection right off the interstate at Stevens City, there's another location down there. <clears throat> that is our four surrounding, closest surrounding sites to our target area. And so what the objective is, of course, is to get something in the middle which will offload those other sites and also provide the necessary coverage in the middle of, this, of the area here. One of the sites that we looked at, of course, uh, I always look for something up in the air. What, what's up in the air that we can possibly use that is feasible? And I, and I push Mr. Saar on this <clears throat> extensively, and that is the water tank there at the uh, sanitation authority. Um, currently, there is an installation on that water tank, and it does not. It was, uh, you know, Chantel has, has uh, merged with Nintelos. Nintelos is on, located on that water tank, and so they were going to rebuild that site to try to make it work for this area, and it will not work. They've done extensive testing on it, and it will not work for that. So that's what brought us to this. Um, some of the areas I looked at, at the intersection of uh, Warrior and Tasker, there's a CVS and a convenience store. <clears throat> I attempted to go on the rooftop of the CVS. There again, through RF evaluation, it was not tall enough to get the antennas high enough to clear the trees to provide the necessary coverage. We looked at the convenience store to put in some sort of a uh, structure at that location on the property with uh, uh, HN Funkhauser, and there again, we couldn't get enough height in there to make anything work. Um, I talked with um, the county, and we looked at something at Sharando Park, um, way up on the north end of the park. Uh, based on uh, the way the property was acquired through funding from the park service and things like that, that turned out that that is not a feasible operation. Right up there, also at that north end of the park, there is a piece of property on Land Grant Lane. Uh, went to that property owner and talked with them. And uh, where we would have to place the, part, the, the tower on their property to, to make it fit at all <coughs> was right in the spot where they were in the, in the process of building or planning on building a home right there. So. Mm -hmm. We moved on from there. Um, I spoke with the Frederick County Sanitation Authority folks. Um, on the end of Lakeside Drive, there is a collection pond um, that's Frederick County property. Spoke with those folks about possibly building, building something up there. Um, and there again, the, the, it's, I think it was more or less a leasing issue because the deed has a restriction on it that requires, if the land is not used by Frederick County Sanitation Authority, it reverts back to the original owner. So uh, there was another parcel up there that was open space with the Wakeland Manor Homeowners Association. And I went through um, some coordination and some negotiations with uh, the Homeowners Association. <clears throat> and they ultimately elected not to, uh, not to pursue a lease with this. <clears throat> Uh, I spoke with the property owner in this large spot right across there from, you know, right across the street from, uh, from the library in the large open space property there. I spoke with those folks about placing a tower on that property <clears throat> and at that time said that they were not interested in, in leasing us property. So having gone through, through all those, I then approached uh, Mr. Charon. Uh, and ask formally if the county was interested in leasing property at the Bowman Library. Um, 
we arranged a meeting. I met with staff. Uh, we went through uh, discussions and ultimately came back and uh, negotiated a lease and presented it before the Board of Supervisors and <coughs> signed the lease with uh, the county. So uh, that brings us to that where we are right now. On uh, one day when it was not windy, which is far and few between here recently, but I uh, snuck up here and took a um, flew a balloon at 200 feet <clears throat> in various areas around the around the site. You can see the little green green spot there. That is the proposed tower location. And then at the uh, the various intersections um, where people would be stopped. Um, taking, uh, you know, stop to stop sign, waiting for traffic where they would have a, a view of the tower. And so um, we went through, and that is from uh, Tasker Road and Lakeside Drive, about 500 feet from that intersection was where that tower would be located. <clears throat> and that's from Mimosa Drive and Lakeside Drive, about 1166 feet away. Uh, Butternut and Chinkapin Drive. And then that's from uh, Chinkapin Drive uh, as you pull in by the, uh, by the um, uh, townhouses. And then this is that uh, there's a little pull off along Tasker Road uh, gravel area and that would be from that location. Um, We, uh, on January 17th, we held a community meeting, uh, sent out notification to <clears throat> all the surrounding property owners, and held a community meeting at the Bowman Library. Um, very good discussion. Um, people were asking, uh, you know, questions uh, about uh, health concerns, about uh, the visual concerns. Um, and, and, you know, just, just various questions that, uh, you know, they wanted, they wanted to get some comfort level with. So I thought it was a very good meeting. And um, with that, we uh, uh, got, went ahead with the uh, application and, and we are here at the meeting. With that, if you don't have any questions immediately for me, uh, I'll answer Mr. Unger's question why we didn't, why we're, why we're moving it back. Um, between where the tower is located and the, the um, fence uh, by the little parking area, there is a uh, sanitary line goes through there that we, are, we wanted to make sure we stayed far enough from and we couldn't move the tower up and, and have, uh, have the room to uh, put it in there with the uh, additional ground equipment without being close to that, that sanitary line. And so that's why we backed it up farther <clears throat> to stay away from that. And the area that is up against the lake. Okay. So uh, no other questions from me or? Uh, yes, sir. I have one question. Uh, if you could clarify, is this, is this, uh, tower to improve service or is it to provide service? Does, does this area have cell service, wireless service? You know, I understand the data issues and things of that nature, but you know, that's you know, to me an important question about whether or not this is essential for service within this area or whether or not they have service and this is just to, which is an important consideration to improve it. I'll let, I'll let Mr. Sarr, if you don't mind, get into the specifics from the RF side. Okay. Mr. Kerner, Mr. Thomas yes, has a question. Uh, yes, the, uh, the topo in that area slopes down toward Lakeside Drive. Yes, sir. So the waiver is really from the rear property line uh, in pretty much an unoccupied area. But when you go on the eastern side toward Lakeside Drive, if the tower should collapse, uh, would there be some kind of provisions or 
a, an assurance from your engineer that it wouldn't end up being on Lakeside Drive or rolling into Lakeside Drive with on a pole tower uh, that would have the ability to to go down the slope. Yes, sir. We have we have. Uh uh, engineer report that we provided to uh, Mr. Chairman with the application that the tower will be designed to collapse within about 73 feet and we're 180 some feet I think 180 couple feet from Lakeside. Yeah that, that's part of my concern but when it collapses being a monopole tower it could travel especially if it's high winds and that would be the only reason it would collapse. Are you going to have some kind of a barrier physical barrier that would keep it from rolling down into Lakeside Drive. I understand the part about it collapsing within the 50% of the, the height and all that, but uh, would there be some kind of a barrier to keep it off of Lakeside Drive if it collapses and breaks up as it's collapsing, which it probably would, to keep it off Lakeside Drive? We can, we can definitely look at that. I don't know of any, um, you know, we have not designed anything in that manner, sir. But, wish you'd be sensitive to that because yes. that that's more of a concern to me. I mean, the, the back uh, part just goes into the lake or into an unoccupied area, but we don't want it following on Lakeside Drive if there's traffic there. Yes, sir. And understand with the topography, that's really the, the more concerning side than the back side. We'll make no, I'll make note of that and and do some some research, see what we can determine for you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, Mr. Sir, just you elaborate on a community meeting you had and the feedback from that. You didn't elaborate too much on that. You positive, negative? We had we had um, a few comments. People a few comments were there where people were just um, I think coming to to see what was going on and we had um, answered our questions regarding uh, the uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and the effect, health effects. Uh, we had uh, some questions came up about the uh, effect of the ecosystem on the on the the pond or the lake, the fish, the the turtles, and and also on the property if it was even could be could be used for that because of any restrictions and things like that, um, and then. Uh, Real estate property values. I think that was the pretty much the main discussions that were held, and uh, you know we answered the questions and uh, the attendees provided uh, you know comments and and shared some some of their information that they'd received from you know research and and previous history of the property. Okay, thank you. Anyone else for Mr. Kerner? Thank you, sir. Mr. Sar. <clears throat> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christopher Saar. I work for Chantel. I am a radio frequency engineer that's in charge of handling designing the network for the Winchester area to provide the best service we can for our customers. So part of what I'm here to really speak upon is why we want to put this tower here from a service perspective. All right. If you look at this map closely, um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's a lot of blue dots. Each one of the blue dots represents one of our customers as of 2015. And the data is not always real time. We have quite a few people in this area that are customers of ours that we've identified as in need of better service. So this is a very concentrated area. Uh, it's almost as concentrated as the downtown portion of Winchester itself. We're trying to improve the service in this area. This prediction, basically, I can break down the, the colors. Green means you can use your handset indoors, outdoors, pretty much anywhere. Red pretty much depicts that you can reliably use your handset outdoors. The white areas, I would call that unreliable. I would not say cannot use, but it would be unreliable service in the area. If you can go back to what we're looking at here, what we have is a lot of white areas in that area and red zones, basically places where it's unreliable service for our customers as well as places where the service is not reliable indoors. 
By placing this site at the Bowman Library, we are able to improve the service in this area and make a lot more service available indoors. What this does is a couple things. Not only does it provide service indoors for our customers, but it also allows the general amount of data that they use to be more reliable and higher data speeds. This area is one of the slowest areas in the Frederick County area with the highest des density of customers in our, it's one of our highest profile targets as far as improving our customer experience. We know this also because we monitor the speeds of the data people use on the surrounding sites, which Mr. Kerner talked about where they are. We can tell that our customers are not having a good experience. Uh, not on only that, but on Monday, I actually had to answer an email from a customer. Let's go back to one of these blue dots in, uh, let's see. Right a little bit northwest of the lake itself, I had to answer a customer's complaint about why their handset was not working inside their building. I explained that the service in this area is not that reliable, but we are actively pursuing putting a site in the area, hopefully this year. We looked at the population density in this area as well as the number of customers that we have in this area. We found that by placing the site at this location, we would improve service for over 2,000 customers for in the local area. Basic population maps show that the entire area in this region has about 7,400 residents as of 2015. That's the data that we have as far as populations. We also have uh, the sense that we have other car carriers that are looking to improve service in this area as well based on you know, their, their customers are having similar experiences. Um, that's basically, does, I'm sorry, that, does that answer your question, sir? Because you asked Mr. Kerner a very specific question earlier. Okay. Um, that's pretty much what I'm here to present, unless there are any other questions before I turn everything back over to Mr. Donahue. Any other questions? Don't see any. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Chair, very briefly, I want to go back to the, the question about the community meeting there. There were um, <coughs> good questions and good back and forth, as, as Lynn said. There were a couple of things that were discussed that I wanted to highlight. One has to do with property valuation. We often get this um, assertions that a cell tower is going to devalue property. I gave you some quotes there to, uh, to think about. One is in a, a peer-reviewed magazine, and the first quote, which says, if I can read here, no consistent market evidence suggests that any negative impact upon improved residential properties exposed to such facilities in the area included in the study. Following uh, the second um, bullet point is from an um, impact study, monopole impact study that we shared with the community in, back in January. Now, admittedly, it's in Montgomery County, it's across the river, but it had to do with a cell tower on the Bullis School and where the man assessed the resale um, values, the actual sales price of homes some which could see the tower and those which could not see the tower. And he found no discernible difference between the two. And that's your second bullet. And the third one is, this is interesting, this is Fairfax County, so admittedly in a, a different county. Um, but the tax assessor in Fairfax County was asked whether uh, people could get a break on taxes if they lived in proximity to the cell towers. And his quote there, which says, we found no evidence that proximity to a cell tower affects property value. Appraisal associations such as Appraisal Institute and the International Association of Assessing Offices have published several studies which have concluded that cell towers do not affect property values. We get the question a lot, and we try to share the information, and so I wanted to share that with you. And, um, and lastly, we also get the question about health effects. Now, I think the Commission knows well that the FCC holds the keys with respect to RF emissions. Uh, we've got to be in compliance, but it's literally out of your hands to deal with RF emissions. Fair enough, but at the community meetings, we talk about it, and we tried to share the information that the FCC provides. There's a wonderful uh, repository of information at the FCC's OET, and we provided that link. We try to answer those questions in hopes of getting folks to understand that the health effects argument, while the subject of federal law, 
is also something that there's an awful lot of study about and there's an awful lot of information available and the FCC really is the best, best information source on that score. I wanted you to be aware of that. That's all I have, Madam Chair, unless there are questions for me. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing, and we would like to invite anyone in the audience who would like to speak to us regarding this uh, conditional use permit to come forward and give us your name and magisterial district, please. I'm Dr. James Sylvester. I live at 102 Lakeside Drive. I believe I'm in the Shawnee District. Um, <laughs> I stood before this committee 30 years ago with Harrington Smith, and we fought a tremendous battle over this track of land that has been called the Lakeside Recreational Lot. When we moved here in uh, 1985 and built my home, I was told that it could never be developed and commercially developed. Through the years, and there were 600 Lakeside residents that stood behind us at that particular time and that's why the Bowman Library is there today. Uh, there had been other attempts to develop some portions of those, that property on the corner of Chincapin and, uh, and, and Tasker Road. There was a proposed 7-Eleven. We beat that back. We did allow those townhouses there because we thought they were aesthetically nice. Now, I sent you all a letter, and I don't know how, if you all have had time to read that letter or not. It's a four-page letter. And I want to thank you for allowing me to speak tonight, and happy Ash Wednesday. Anyway, we fought this battle, and I have gone through the deeds. Uh, I'm going to recite my letter uh, to you because maybe some of you haven't had time to read it. Uh, I'll try to go through it and skip through it as quickly as I can. I think it's very important for you all to know specific aspects of this project that they're proposing. So if you don't mind, it'll take me about five minutes. I'll go through it. Um, and, and bear with me. Um, if former Supervisor Harrington Smith were alive today, I don't think he would be very happy with the proposed placement of the Chantel Tower. Thirty years ago, Harrington, a resident of Lakeside, and I stood before this planning commission and board of supervisors to stop the commercial development of the Lakeside Recreational Track, which was set aside as common area. Helped by 600 Lakeside residents, we succeeded with the Bowman Library being a compromised solution. And I think no one would argue the cultural contributions of that library to our neighborhood and the whole county. Prior to the library, there were tennis courts on the track and fishing piers on the lake. Its intent has always been for recreational purposes and the plats that I've attached, and you all were sent those plats, obtained from the planning department, prove that point. I went back to that file that has not been opened since 1986, and I pulled the plats, and they're there. The lake is now an enclosed ecosystem harboring seven species of fish, turtles some 18 inches in diameter, and nesting sites for cooper hawks, which control rodents within our neighborhood. To what extent the concentrated microwave radiation will harm the lake, or even humans within the area, cannot be determined for lack of studies confined to the United States. <laughs> but who wants to take the risk? Fifty years ago, we were told that smoking didn't, didn't harm us, and now it does. Europe and Asia are years ahead of the United States in cell technology, and many countries within these regions have conducted detailed studies on the harmful effect of cell towers on humans. I attach those in my letters to you. This study, the one from India, prompted the government of India to pass restrictive legislation about cell towers. I'm also uh, attaching, and I attached it to you, a Canadian article abstract about human health and cell towers backed by 61 world-class scientists who support the article findings that call for extensive regulations concerning those cell towers. A this gentleman is correct. A municipality cannot reject a cell tower application based on health and or environmental issues per the 1996 Telecom Act. It would open the county to suit in federal court. But an application can be rejected based upon other factors such as zoning, aesthetic values, and deed covenants that run with the land, which I will address below. Lakeside, Wakeland, Wake, Lakeside and Wakeland Manor are known for their underground utilities. It's been a hallmark of this area. 
I know of no other above ground utilities other than telephone poles along Tasker Road, which I believe sit on state property, and a few light poles within the town townhome sections. There are none within Old Lakeside single family areas, nor on the 42 acre recreational lot known as the common area. Placing the cell towers on the proposed location would ruin the aesthetics of the area. And the United States Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled that cell tower requests can be rejected based upon aesthetics. At the Shintel meeting, which, was, which is, they, do, they didn't do it out of the goodness of their heart, it's required by the FCC. Veteran real estate professional who's here tonight, Leo Smith, <clears throat> noted that cell towers dampen the value of nearby homes. Chantel countered with a study from Montgomery County, Maryland. Smith quickly dismissed the study as one being based on population density zoning. And I, I am attaching an abstract noting that cell towers negatively affect local housing prices by as much as 20%. They have their studies, we have ours. I sent you all the abstract of that study. The common area was conveyed to Lakeview, this is very important. The common recreational area was conveyed to Lakeview Townhouses Incorporated by deed. It was recorded on December 3rd, 1973 and is a matter of record in deed book 422, page 65 and 66. The covenants and restrictions imposed on the common recreational area were duly recorded on March 6, 1974, in deed book 427, pages 777 through 803. On pages 780 and 81 of the deed of, of dedication, it clearly states these covenants and restrictions run with the land. Well, this means these covenants and restrictions would survive future conveyances of the property, such as the Bowman Library track, as it was cut from the original common recreational open space. Quoting on page 789, the common area shall be used only for purposes for which it is intended in the, in the furnishing of services and facilities for the enjoyment of the owners. Any amendments to the covenants and restrictions must, must have 75% approval from the Lakeview townhouse lot owners with amendments recorded pro uh, properly. <clears throat> Shintel's market is thin in this area, dwarfed by Verizon, Sprint and ATT. I believe their motivation is to lease space on the tower to other carriers as, exposed, as, a, as opposed to expanding their market share of cell phone users. How this benefits the owners is unclear and seems to profit only Chantel and the county by collecting a, a lease fee. I reviewed the file within the Frederick County Planning Office and attaching the plats outlining the common recreational area which I sent to you all. And I discovered two letters, one from a local attorney, the other from what appears to be a private planner, both dated 1986. Both were apparently commissioned by the developer at the time to prove that he owned the common recreational area. Both concluded that no deed of conveyance or deed of dedication were found among the land records. However, my investigation, and I believe the county attorney will agree, that both a deed of de a conveyance to Lakeview Townhouse Incorporated and a deed of dedication of covenants and restrictions exist from the early 70s. Both the attorney and the planner at the time recommended the county avoid making any decisions about the recreational lot until reviewed by the circuit court. Which brings up an unpleasant issue. Was the library track properly conveyed and does a cloud exist on that deed? If you reference deed book 422, pages 50, 65 and 66, dated December 3rd, 1973, and recited above, you will notice a conveyance of the lakeside recreational lots to a Lakeview Townhouses Incorporated, is what I said, the original nonprofit homeowners association. This organization still exists and reports to the SEC under ID 01408731. The registered agent is the Coventry Property Group at 21 South Kent Street in Winchester. They manage this property. I assume the original Townhouse Association still owns it. There are two other associations. The Lakeside Condominium Homeowners Association managed by Cambridge Companies and the Lakeside Development Homeowners Association, excuse me, 
The Lakeside Development Homeowners Association, the one I just mentioned, I'm sorry, they think that they own the common recreational properties used by the developer to, to convey the Bowman Library track. This is also managed by Cambridge. But as you see, can see above, the original townhome association owns the respective uh, uh, recreational open space lots and no further conveyances can be found in the records. And that br brings up a serious is issue of whether there's a cloud on the Bowman pro or on the library property or not. Here's the issue. It appears from the records that the original townhome association, Lakeview Incorporated, still owns the recreational common area, area lots referenced above, and the developer never owned the recreational open space lots to transfer. This could place a cloud across the Bowman Library deed. The Ben Butler letter within the planning office filed in 1996 stated that no deed transferring the recreational lots exists is simply inaccurate. The lots were conveyed to a nonprofit Lakeview Townhouses Incorporated recited above. Butler was the developer's attorney at the time and the developer was trying to gain control of the recreational lot for commercial development purposes. The general perception was that the developer owned the recreational lots by transference from the Lakeside Development Homeowners Associations, which never owned the recreational lots in the first place. He then donated 16 acres to the county for the Bowman Library. It appears to be a bogus transaction unless you can find that the original homeowners association, Lakeview Townhouses, conveyed the open space lots later to the second townhome association. The Bowman Library tract may be clouded and may never have the authority to, to transact any business relative to the Bowman tract. The 1986 B Butler letter implied that the county should not engage in activities related to the lakeside recreational open, sp open space lots, and it may be a matter of the circuit courts to sort out as recited above, and I concur with Mr. Butler on that issue. I intend to oppose the, the cell tower all the way to the courts, if necessary. But now the stakes are much higher. The Bowman Library has proven to be a cultural icon and mecca for our county. As a professional educator, I don't want to disturb or dismantle anything that would harm that library. But I would highly recommend a postponement of the conditional use permit hearing and give the county attorney and other people involved more time to sort out the issues and take any remedial steps should it be required. The county attorney, and he's been very kind to me, I've shown up at his office several times unannounced and he always, he always invites me in, offers me some water and anyway. The county attorney has countered that any claim against the library deed could be defended based upon adverse possession in the circuit courts. I had this legally reviewed by my attorney based on the 2009 Supreme Court ruling affirming six foundations upon which to declare adverse possession. The review suggests the argument would fail based upon one, maybe two foundations not being met. And an argument for adverse possession is an admission that the library sits on a squatter's deed and the citizens of our county deserve a better solution. No that early on the citizens of Lakeside are massing to oppose the cell tower. It's early, we've just kind of formulated in the last week or so, and there is a, an online petition if you all have had a chance to look at it, but, but try to read some of the comments from the citizens in there. I think 91 or 92 have signed the petition, and it's very enlightening. I'm a big fan of the library, and in some small way, consider it my baby waking up every morning looking across the field with great pride and satisfaction at the cultural icon it has become. Placing an aesthetically distasteful for-profit structure in full view of residential areas next to, next to a cultural asset destroys the original intent for this track of land. I hope that all those concerned will consider the legalities and opinions and views of residents of this area before deciding on the proposed cell tower. Would you all put the copy of the cell tower up taken from Lakeside Drive again, please? I'd like to see it. <clears throat> well, I, I don't know how to work it. I want the one taken from Lakeside Drive. Right there. That's good enough. 
That is ugly. That is out of the Lord of the Rings. That's what we at Luxan are going to have to stare at every morning. Do you want it in your front yard, in your neighborhood? Nobody has defined the health risk involved. There are studies that say there's none. There are studies that say there is. Don't take the risk. It's like watching Andy Griffith smoke cigarettes in the 1960 sitcom because, and then doing commercials for Chesterfield. Well, back then, nobody thought that those cigarettes hurt anybody. So who's to say in 30 or 40 years from now that that cell tire won't be harmful uh, to, to our people uh, in that neighborhood? There's 5,000 people that live around in that area. There's children that go to, 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 go to the library for, for children's programs. So I don't have any other thing to, to offer. Just want you to know that 30 years ago, Harrington Smith and I stood here before this very committee and the Board of Supervisors defending that from commercial development. I thank you for your time, and I'm available to meet with any of you all. I have the plats to back up what I'm saying. And thank you, sir. Please vote your conscience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak? If you'll come forward. Let me, you know, I feel it's necessary at this point to uh, say a couple things, and that is there are a number of things involved in this application. And the Planning Commission has a specific layer of it, and our job is to find out whether or not this proposal meets First of all, the requirements of the telecommunications uh, uh, laws that we have regarding them. And the other is, is this a good land use? Unfortunately, we don't and are not supposed to get into the business of who owns what. And so I, I would hope that you would hear <coughs> from us our position on this application. So I just had to say that. Sir, come on up and tell us who you are. Madam Chair, members. Uh, my name is Michael Roma, and I'm here with my wife, Janet. And uh, we've been um, occupants of 106 Lakewood Drive since we fled Northern Virginia in, uh, let's see, it was 1988. <clears throat> we moved into this area and been very glad to be here all this time. I want to thank Dr. Sylvester for his, his uh, comments and his, uh, his, his great work on, on this issue. Um, I oppose the building of this cell tower based on, first of all, the area that we moved into nearly 30 years ago is, is residential. It is coded residential. And it needs to remain residential. The health risks are not to be lightly taken. I've spent my life in healthcare and seeing the ramifications of radiation on individuals. This is not a light, a light issue. And many times, and it was just like smoking, where you don't know it at the time. And of course, you can't always believe what industries say about themselves. I want to thank you for your time and appreciate the opportunity to address you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, thanks for coming. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members, for this chance to give our <coughs> opinions. My name is Maya White Sparks, and I live in the village at Lakeside in the Shawnee District, and I strongly oppose the proposed cell tower for many reasons. For one, it would destroy the beauty and integrity of a precious green space in my community. I often visit this exact area in question to find balance through communion with nature and moments of undisturbed, peaceful solitude and exercise. Indeed, research has shown that green spaces promote healthy living, including psychological restoration that is so crucial to mental health. 
I have observed many people over the years gathering with friends for a picnic and fishing, using the lake and adjoining areas for much needed, no cost recreation. I also observe children playing in these areas. The placement of a cell tower would not only disrupt the delicate wetlands environment, there's a stream that runs right below that hill that has been flourishing there. It would make an unwelcoming eyesore that people will want to avoid, especially if they read many of the scientific studies that point out the health dangers caused by being within 500 meters of a cell tower, including higher risk of cancer. Also, library staff would be exposed daily to an industrial scene and unhealthy frequencies as will children and the elderly who use the library. Shame on Chantel for even considering the space. Green spaces have been shown to have positive economic impacts as well. There is a significant link between the value of a property and its proximity to green spaces. In a time when middle and working class people are struggling to save a penny, the value of our homes are sometimes the only way that we can increase our wealth. To place a cell tower in this precious oasis of green is like handing homeowners investments in their property directly to Chantel and to whomever would be collecting the rent. In recent years, there have been many cases when cell towers caught fire, leaned over, exploded, if near a propane leak, or collapsed, crushing vehicles, killing three people in Summit Park, West Virginia, as well as numerous instances of workers falling to their deaths from them. Cell towers can also attract criminal activity with people stealing copper. As a citizen, I have participated in the development of the comprehensive plan of Frederick County. I have seen that the Planning Commission has a vision for land use in our county in which residential areas are to be built around hubs like our library. We are a model of such development. I believe that the planners and the Board of Supervisors have laid out a balance of commercial, industrial, residential, recreational land uses for our growing urban development area. Greenways and green spaces are vital yet small part, uh, they are, are a vital yet small part of the plan and should be guarded at all costs from invasion by commercial and industrial forces. I hope and pray and I ask this planning commission to hold fast to the vision that you have developed and do not sacrifice its wisdom for the exploitative and unnecessary plans of a corporation that apparently has no compunctions about grabbing delicate and beautiful green common areas that belong to the people. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like? <clears throat> I'm just gonna read. May I have your name, please? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Teresa Vogel and I stand before you as a long-term volunteer of the Stewardship of Virginia adopt a student program. The Lakeside Link has been a part of the Department of Con Conservation and Recreation adopt a stream program for over a decade. I have, over the years, with other dedicated volunteers, given sweat and tears to clean this lake to preserve the natural ecosystem. Lakeside Lake, Tasker Lake, is a thriving 
ecosystem that is valued by its residents and is in a designated common area on a recreational track. I came here today to express my concern regarding the conditional use permit for a cell tower at this location. Although the 1996 Telecommunications Act prohibits environmental and human health issues from being considered as an important or even a concern. There is significant studies to warrant caution with the placement of a cell tower so near to a residential area. Although our government places profit above concerns for its citizens, in the 1996 Telecommunications Act, I implore you implore you please please consider putting the people first and deny the conditional use permit on the grounds of it being zoned a common recreational area. It is my personal opinion that Chantel should locate that tower along with the other towers and leave the safety and well-being of the lakeside community alone. <coughs> there appears to be some questions about who actually owns the land. Those questions should be resolved before anything else is done. Since this issue has come to light, I ask, I'm sorry, June, I ask, who owns the property and whose permission signature is needed to continue the Adopt a Stream program? In closing, I ask, what le legacy do you want, do you plan to leave behind? Each and every one of you have an obligation to the people to do what is in the best interest of the people. This area is not a commercially zoned area. It's for the citizens to use and enjoy. Please keep it that way. Instead of allowing Chantel the permit to install a tower that will emit microwave radiation and possibly, possibly cause brain damage, irreversible irreversible infertility and damage to DNA in all animals and humans. Please do the research. Although you cannot base your decision on the possible health effects or environmental impacts, you can deny the permit based upon zoning issues property devalu devaluation, and the fact that it will be an eyesore for years. We got the power, no cell tower. They chose the wrong place. There's people who actually care. Please, care. Thank you. Thank you. And this is what a certificate from the gover governor looks like. That's what every volunteer gets when they put their time, sweat, and energy into cleaning that lake. There are people who care, that care, who have put years into this program to help that ecosystem strive, thrive, and be something that we're proud of. Thank you. Thank you.
Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak with us? Anyone? Yes, if you'll come forward. here without a mic will you be able to hear me without a mic I'm sorry I was gonna say if I come around there can you hear me so that I can see her instead of me standing well, here let's give it at a her? try here comes wireless <coughs> hello my name is Ruth I live here, and I've lived here for 10 years, um, close to Winchester. I am in the county, and I've just learned about this tower being set up. And um, yes, I find it very bothersome, because I have three children. And, um, you know, they are my next generation. They are our next generation, and it will affect them. And I was wondering yourselves, um, does it feel all right for you to allow your family and your generations to breathe radiation, the potential for that? I mean, not to insult or anything, but I am curious. I would like to know what your concern is for your, you know, for the younger generation and what. And my children are always asking me concerns about the environment and what is wrong? Why is this there? And why are we doing this to our planet? And how can we make technology better? And why aren't we looking at other ways to make technology more improved? <laughs> as opposed to um, non-consideration of our precious systems that are, are set up around for us. I mean, you know, as we've all said before, it was years ago thought, fine, you could sit around and smoke, and that was allowed, yeah. and that was all right. I have a friend who is um, full of cancer now, and it's a radiation-caused cancer. <clears throat> and that person wasn't sick a day before. And um, they, you know, they breathed fine, and then all of a sudden they've been in, in, exposed to environmental radiation that has caused cancer to them. So I'm just concerned, and I, I really am very curious about um, how this cannot be something that we would consider for our future generations and for our children that are here now, why we are not more focused on um, the care of our children and the protection of our children. For, what did you say, 5,000 people that lack service, somewhat service, not even sure how much service of a dropped phone call? I don't understand why those priorities are not um, a higher priority. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Is there anyone else, sir? I thought I saw another somebody. Oh, sorry. Okay, she's going to, I'm going to, no. Um, she wants to read off of her list. My name is Dana Keith Hartman, and I'm from Stevens City, and I recently moved here from D.C. The reason I moved out here, I wanted to leave the city. I wanted to leave um, all of the um, all of the um, pollution and problems and um, um, city cluster of the city. So I wanted to, and I work in IT as well, and I do know about cell towers, and I understand lousy service. And you know, my suggestion to those customers in that area, transfer over to Verizon. <laughs> There's no problem with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's as simple as that. You know, it's if you're not satisfied with your service provider, there are service providers that are more uh, technologically advanced than what that cell one cell tower will do for you. Also, I am concerned about the radiation. Many people say, no, there is not a health risk to that. However, I would like to take the time to say to you that my generation, which is severely underrepresented here, as opposed to your generation, is a bit more savvy about that. Um, and we do know that um, cell towers are 
um, radiation causing producers. And it is also too close to the library. I mean, that should have been a concern right there for everyone. That's a public entity. Also, I wanted to um, read something that I have down here. According to the um, Mount Shasta Bioregional Geological Centers, studies have shown that even uh, at low levels of this radiation, there's evidence of damage to cell tissue and DNA, and it has been lin linked to brain tumors, cancers, and immune function, and depression, miscarriages, Alzheimer's, and um, numerous other serious issues and health concerns. So maybe now you think it's nothing, you know, right here and right now we're thinking it's nothing, but in 20 or 30 years and more medical studies are being done and more research is coming up, we will know more than we know. Just as we know about smoking 30 years ago was fine and now we know a lot more. I mean, I'm sure that you could find, if you want to continue with the, the business and the corporation, that you could find another area that is less inhabited that would do less damage to set your tower up. Also, there are 91 signatures on that petition that was just sent out. Can you imagine 91 people in this room? I mean, just 91. And, you know, those people aren't here for various reasons right now, and they have their lives. And that's also just the beginning of this petition. That's 91 people in less than a week. So I would like to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I did see some other folks over here, I think. Hi, Madam Chairman. I'm uh, Tim Davis. That's my wife, Darlene Davis, over there. We live at 104 Lakeside Drive, uh, right next to Dr. Sylvester and his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that our two houses are the two houses that are closest to the cell tower, if you look at the picture. Uh, I bought my house in 1990. Um, lived there, it'd be 27 years, and the reason we bought the house was the view. We live up on the hill, higher than any other house there. Every morning, when I drink my coffee, look out my front window, I look over at that beautiful lake, nice field, Bowman. It's really nice. My kids fished in that lake, my son played with my dogs in that field. If I had looked at that house now, and that tower was there, I would seriously think, find someplace else. And I feel that someone would come to buy my house. At my age, I'm thinking about, I've lived there. That's the biggest part of my retirement investment. I lose 20% on that house. That's a big chunk of money. If I want to leave that house to my son, it's a big chunk of money. And it's also, I've got to think about my grandkids living there, if he would come to live in that house. So I have a lot of concerns. I'm not going to take up a lot of your time. Just want you to know that I am very concerned about it, and I oppose it in any way that I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Seeing no one, we will close the public here. Oh. Patiently. <laughs> here you go. Short. I'm Leo Smith. I currently live within a quarter of a mile where the tower would be. I've lived in Frederick County most of my life. I grew up here, went to school here. Even if I didn't live in the area where this tower is going, I would oppose this tower going at the public library there in that area completely. It's all residential. It's not commercial. I am shocked that the Frederick County employees have even gotten this thing this far in, in the process of trying to put it on Frederick County uh, land there by the library. It, this is just just doesn't make sense to me. Um, Mr. Kerr started out today saying the word necessity. The only th person, only corporation that this is a necessity for is for their company. It is not a necessity for the t Frederick County to receive the funds from this. If you need more money, you just raise our t personal property taxes or our real estate taxes. We don't need this as income for Frederick County. This is ridiculous. Um, the, uh, 
as far as other companies, next thing you know, he mentioned Verizon has poor service right in this area. You're going to have Verizon coming before you and asking for them to have another another tower on the property so they can have great service. You know, we've had cell phone services in this area for, what, 20-some years? And if you don't have good service in your neighborhood, you go to a company that does provide you with good service. It's just a matter of common sense. You go to one of the other providers. I'm sorry they want to increase their, their market share, but it doesn't need to be on Bowman Library property. Thank you all for serving in your capa capacity that you serve and listening to us public citizens from time to time with our discouragement. Thank you very much, and you all have a great night. Thank you. Yes. May I have a very brief rebuttal? I need about a minute. Surely. Two things I wanted to address. One has to do with the, the title issue. We've heard Dr. Sylvester's comments on title. We've satisfied ourselves through a title report. The county attorney has satisfied himself and has addressed the matter with, with Dr. Sylvester. The title issue really has been raised and answered. Second one really has to do with environmental. There's suggestions about impact on the stream valley and the turtles and the hawks, et cetera. The phase one environmental has come back and come back clean. So we have addressed environmental. It's an important part of the undertaking here. It hasn't been submitted as part of the conditional use permit, but I can certainly do so. It was dated in, this, in December. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Come on over. Sir, to the mic, please. I mentioned, brought up the issue uh, of the deed situation, he informed me that uh, they had done a deed search and the only one found one deed in uh, 1974. I can tell you right now, there's multiple deeds in that deed book. Sir, so I, I appreciate what you said. Uh, our, our role here is not the deeds. And Understand. Okay, so well, we want to get back to the job that we've been assigned and if there isn't anyone else to speak to us, we will do that. So we will close the public hearing. Yes, Mr. Um, just Thomas. Before, before we uh, start deliberations, I, I want to just remind all the planning commissioners that we need to keep in mind that the ownership and covenant issues are ultimately proprietary issues between other parties, generally outside the commission's purview. Planning Commission's responsibility is to determine whether from a land use planning policy perspective, particular uses are suitable and appropriate in particular relative to the county's comprehensive plan. Uh, cell towers have been controversial. They've not been controversial. Uh, unfortunately, because of our insatiable demand for cell phones and wireless computers, we need to have cell towers. We have cell towers located many, many places over the county. We have one at Sherando High School. Uh, we have them in many residential areas because that's where your users are, residential areas. Uh, so we need to just keep in mind that we need to look at our comprehensive plan, look at our ordinances, our zoning requirements, and to see if this particular use is compliant with our other ordinances and our other uses that we have in the area. If there's no other discussion, well, I do have a, have a comment. If we're, if we're in discussion, I thought that was more of a preamble to discussion where you were giving us ground <laughs> rules. Um, Ownership aside, you know, a lot of those issues, I mean, I, I, to reiterate, that's really not, you know, relevant, you know, to the discussion. But I think what is relevant is land use compatibility. And I, you know, I really struggle with this because I tend to be a fan of fast data, more data, you know, all that stuff. And I know that's an important thing for folks. But I also think we have a responsibility uh, and an obligation to be sure that where these facilities go, uh, you know, fit within the broader community. And we do strive, I think, to try to get them on the edges of residential areas when we can. And when they get close, we get worried 
uh, you know, about what the impacts are. And I, I, I'm not going to say I'm not sympathetic, but I tend to be less sympathetic when they are on the edges, you know, when there's that, that effort. This to me is, you know, right in the heart uh, of a residential area and right, you know, at a very prominent public site. And I understand, you know, Chantel's desire and need to uh, improve their service and, and to want to do that for competitive reasons and for a lot of others, I'm sure. And, and I'm sure there are lots of folks that, you know, would benefit from that um, and, and might hope that this tower would go in to get those benefits. But personally, I view this as, a, as an incompatible use at this particular location. And uh, all the other considerations aside, you know, that's, that's what's going to be, you know, on my mind if we move forward with a vote this evening. Thank you, sir. Any other comments on the part of commissioners? Thoughts? How do you feel? Is that the discussion? I feel like both of you do. I mean, I can go either way. So that, that is a bad position to be in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Again, we, uh, we're kind of caught <clears throat> in the conundrum of yes. the insatiable desire for the service. If you put the service somewhere else, or if you put the, the nexus of the service somewhere else, you don't get the service. I just wonder how many that came up and spoke would be willing to do away with their computer or their cell phone. And that's, that's, uh, yeah. Excuse me. All right. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. So, uh, I think both of our Shawnee district representatives are gone tonight. They're ill. So they're ill. So I will uh, make a motion to recommend approval of conditional use permit 01-17, uh, Shenandoah Mobile, LLC. Is there a second? We need a different recommendation. Madam Chair, uh, if there's not a second for that motion, um, I will offer an alternative motion. Uh, I'd recommend that the Planning Commission uh, forward a recommendation for denial for CUP number 01-17, Bowman Library. Second. Any other thoughts? Any other comments? Shall we vote? And this is yes. to recommend denial to the Board of Supervisors. Mr. Unger? I really feel that we may be doing this injustice, but listening to the people that are here, well, I'm inclined to agree this is probably not a good location, so I vote yes. Tough decision, but I vote yes. I and yes. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't get Holden that. Yes. I didn't get that. Kenny, yes. Triplet, yes. Dunlap, yes. Moon, yes. And the chair votes yes. This will go to the Board of Supervisors. This will go to the Board of Supervisors on April the 12th. Next up. Okay. For the purposes of the commission, um, I just want to advise you that we do have uh, meeting on the 15th so <laughs> we'll, we'll find some other things to worry about are we going to have a move we adjourn second. all in favor Aye. Aye. all opposed thank you